This book begins with the inspiring story of Steve Dawson, his dramatic conversion to Catholicism as a young man, and his founding of St. Paul Street Evangelization, an international apostolate that has grown to hundreds of teams in seven countries in just a few years. Also included are other moving stories of conversion and witness. The authors are ordinary Catholics who have come to love Christ so much that they now talk about him with total strangers in public places. Hi, I'm Amy Catapan. Today we welcome Steve Dawson, author of Catholic Street Evangelization, Stories of Conversion and Witness. After his own powerful conversion to the Catholic faith in 2006, Steve became active in various Catholic ministries and leadership positions in the pro-life movement. He even spent time discerning religious life with the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate before heeding his call to work for the church as a layman. As founder and president of St. Paul Street Evangelization, Steve has been featured on EWTN, Catholic Answers Live, the Radio Maria Network, and Sirius XM Satellite Radio. He currently resides in Michigan with his wife, Maria, and their three children. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Amy, for having me. So I'm excited today to talk about your book on Catholic street evangelization, because I think this is a topic that most Catholics think, oh, this is not for me, we're not street evangelizers, that's for other people out there. And what I love about your book is you start really with your own story. The first couple of chapters are all about you and your conversion story. And you didn't have the uh, holiest of beginnings, maybe. A little bit of a similarity to St. Augustine. So let's start with what you were like as a kid, in case somebody is out there thinking, oh, you've got to be holy from the get-go to be a street evangelizer. Yeah. yeah, no, not being holy is an understatement. I was a terror. Um, I was the child that uh, the parents said to their children, do not hang out with this child. You know, you know I convinced my friends to sneak out of the house with me. I remember the, the first time I drove a car, I was 13 years old, and... Um, I pushed my dad's brand new Thunderbird Super Ooh. Coupe out of the, it was, it was nice. <laughs> it was nice. I'd never driven before, but I thought, you know, I, I really need a little bit of excitement in my life. <laughs> I pushed the car out of the driveway because I didn't want to start it in, in the driveway because I didn't want to wake yeah. my parents up. So I pushed it down the driveway. I got in, I started it up and I, I drove around my neighborhood. I went out on a, a major street, Woodward Avenue in, in the Detroit area. And I was nervous. My heart was pounding. And, and like I said, I was 13. So I was just, you know, below the steering wheel yeah. like that. I pulled into a parking lot. I was, I had enough. I was going to go home. There was another parking lot across the street. And I, as I was uh, turning out of the parking lot, I looked up and there was a police officer and he was sitting uh -huh. right in front of me. And so I said, you know, I, I like said, oh, you go ahead, sir. Cause he had his blinker on. It's like, go ahead. And he's like, uh, uh, you go ahead like that. And so now my heart is really pounding. So I, you know, I turned out and I'm going the exact speed limit. I took a right, then another right, and then another right. And I looked in my rear view mirror and he was gone. So I thought, oh, he's not behind me. He must have just left. So I, I, I floored it. I went, I went through a neighborhood at like 40, 50 miles an hour. And the next thing I know, flashers right behind me. Oh. And so I did the most prudent thing that I thought I should do, and I floored it. I just, I thought, I need to get out of here. So I, I'm like 100 miles an hour, and I, I came around a turn, and the car just, I, I couldn't stop fast enough. I turned sideways, I hit a guardrail, and it, um, it could, like basically cut the car in half behind me. And, but, and so I came to a stop, I was uninjured. I thank God for that, I know yeah. it's my guardian angel. And, but all I could think is like, I got to get out of here. So I'm like trying to start the car back up. It wasn't starting, you know, a minute later or something. Uh, the police officer comes to the window with his flashlight and he's shining in. He, he later said he thought I was dead, you know. Wow. And so for some reason, the electronics in the car worked. So I just rolled down the window and I looked up at him. I said, uh, what seems to be the problem, officer? And uh he didn't think that was funny. So he yeah. pulled me out of the car. He threw me on the ground. He handcuffed me. That was the first time I was arrested, but not the last. I got involved in drugs, alcohol, partying, girls. I mean, all the bad things. You know, looking back, I, what I was really looking for was happiness. Mm. You know, 
And all the drugs, all the partying, all the girls, all that kind of stuff was just to like fulfill my heart, you know, my, some need for joy. But, you know, I was doing it with the, the things of this world that don't fulfill. And instead of joy, what I had, what really I ended up with was misery. You know, I, I literally, I came to a, a point in my life where I, I thought, you know, if this is all that life is, you know, I don't want to live anymore. When I was young, my mom was a Catholic. She had me baptized, but she was kind of falling away from the faith. So I didn't, in the early years, I didn't, I didn't grow up with the faith. But I think what, I, what happened is I drove my mom to her knees through all the trouble I got into. She was like fearful that I was going to die and all these things. And so, so did she almost come back to the faith before you really did? Yeah, she, she did. She, in fact, like I said, I drove her to her knees and I think she really came back to the faith strongly and she was praying for me. And she kept saying to me, you know, Steve, if you don't find God, if you don't get God in your life, into this picture of, of this life of yours, you are going to die. You're going to be miserable. And you're not going to spend eternity in heaven. And there is an eternity, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. And so I would reflect on this. And from all ex external, like, if you looked at me, you would say this was pushing me further away. But it was going through my head. I was thinking about it. And at some point, I just, I said, all right, you know what? I went outside. I got on my knees. I looked at the sky. I put down my fifth of Jack Daniels. And, uh, and, I, and I said, all right, God, I don't know if you exist, but if you do, you're going to have to show me, mm. you know. And, you know, I didn't get a vision or an apparition or anything like that, but, but something changed that day. What, what happened is from that moment on, I got, I think, an outpouring of God's grace and a great desire to search for truth. So at this, at the, so I wasn't converted at this point, but I was searching very strongly. So I, I would get on the internet, I'd look at proofs for the existence of God. I would look at, um, you know, I'd try to answer the question, does God exist? And if he does, who is he, you know? Yeah. And Had you been confirmed in the faith or you'd only been like baptized? Or I was like, baptized, okay. I was confirmed, I received the, all my sacraments. And so as I was searching for God, I, I'll tell you, the last thing I wanted to be was Christian, and especially Catholic. I did not want to be Catholic. But at some point, I did come to believe that God existed. Uh, and then at some point along the journey, I believe that Jesus uh, was is God incarnate, he, he, that God existed and he became man in the person of Jesus and Christianity was true. And then it was just a short while from that to realizing that Jesus founded a church and it's the Catholic church. And at that point, you know, I had a big problem because I believed in, in Christianity and in Jesus. I believed in the Catholic Church. I was even watching Catholic television, like, and different things on, on the internet. But while I was doing it, I was still getting drunk. Mm -hmm. and, and I had not given up my moral depravity, so to speak. So I knew that I, I needed to to take that next step, you know. So I think, is this the point where you're realizing you need to come back home for the Catholic Church, but you've got all these sins kind of weighing you down, yeah. right? And I didn't want to give them up, yeah. really. But at some point, you know, really at some point, God just gave me the grace and I, I contacted my mother and I said, I need to get to confession right now because it's either all or nothing. And so how much time do you feel like this conversion took? Because I, there's a point in the book where you're saying it, it was almost like you're a person recovering from a long illness. Yeah. Right? This isn't like, a, okay, I confessed once or mm -hmm. twice and I'm done, right? Right. I'd say it was miraculously rapid in a certain, in a certain mm -hmm. sense. It took me some time, but I don't think as much time as, naturally speaking, as it should have taken. I mean... You know, I had to put my body through a lot of abuse and I mean, I should be brain damaged, you know, from all the drugs that I did. And um, I'd say, you know, it took me a good year to kind of really pull out of it. And, and then how long from 
making this conversion and going through this process of penance and such to getting to a point to evangelizing and realizing mm. I need I need to tell other people yeah. about this. Yeah, well, very rapidly after I went to that confession, I became very fervent in the faith, going to Bible studies and devotions at church, uh, holy hours, um, doing pro-life work. And as I was learning about the church, I started discerning priesthood. And it, it was there, uh, in that discernment process, um, in my, I was introduced with, to the Franciscans of the Immaculate. And they um, take the spirituality of St. Maximilian Kolbe. Um, you know, St. Francis, but particularly St. Maximilian Kolbe, they were involved in media, great devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the, the Miraculous Medal. And, and one of the things, I knew that I was called to evangelize, um, but I didn't really know how. And, and they taught me um, St. Maximilian's method, well, one of his methods, which was simply to give out to random people miraculous medals. It was through um, that experience that I, that I really became convinced that God was calling me to be extremely involved in evangelization, to see the importance of evangelization, and really the the um, a method for evangelization, which was simply by starting conversations through the miraculous medal. When did you get to the point then of being um, a street evangelist? When did right. you go from miraculous medals to yeah. street evangelization? When I was in my twenties. I was doing some school in Portland, Oregon. I had three years of college studies, and I, I thought after I got married, I should finish up my, my degree. So I moved back to Portland, Oregon, because I didn't want to lose credits, you know, if I transferred those. And it was there that I began really feeling called to do more in evangelization, um, more than just pass out miraculous medals. And I think part of what, what um, led me to, to get this desire in my heart was, Portland has um, a lot of street fairs, it has you know, street entertainers, it also has evangelists, like Protestant evangelists, Jehovah's Witness evangelists, Mormon evangelists, but I never have ever experienced Catholic evangelist out on the street in public. And I would ask my friends, you know, you know, when was the last time you, saw, you were out somewhere and you saw Catholics doing evangelization? And the answer was always the same. I never. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I thought to myself, wow, you know, in the Catholic Church, we have the fullness of, of truth. We have the fullness of the Christian faith. And these, these, um, non-Catholic Christian religions and non-Catholic, non-Christian religions, even mm -hmm. like the Mormons, they're gaining a lot of converts through evangelization. They don't even have the fullness of truth. And and where are we? You know, we got to be out there. So this, I got this desire, but it was really, I think, the 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 environment of Portland and. Um, that really kind of said, well, you know, all these other groups are doing these things. Why don't we just go out there and set up a little table and hand out rosaries and And we at this smells. point is you and your wife, Me right? and my wife and a couple okay. of friends. About midnight, I decided I was just so on fire by what I was reading that I went online to see if there was possibly a group around here that I could join because I just was so moved by what I was reading. After I finished the book, I decided I have a great pastor in a great parish here in San Francisco. And I was mentioning to him how much I was motivated by the book and wished that there was a group that I could join to, to participate with. And he says, well, start one here. <laughs> so I made everybody who uh, was interested read the book. 
uh, to make sure they understood the concepts and make sure that they understood you know how to go about it and, and we wanted it to be exactly as Steve set it up. Uh, as an evangelical I did street evangelization and seeing Catholics doing this and he hearing conversion stories and testimonies of people's lives affected by a quote street witness, uh, informal witness, encountering people in their daily lives, providing resources for them, telling them stories about Jesus and the transformative power of Jesus' love, seeing that operative in the Catholic Church. And I've, I've seen it in other ministries and apostles over the years, but it was so tangible in these stories that St. Paul Street Evangelization was sharing with us that it inspired me and it helped me remember that this day-to-day -day witness is an important component of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. We use this term missionary disciple today to underscore the fact that true discipleship and following of Jesus is inherently missionary. That is to say, it's inherently oriented to reaching out towards others and helping others come to know Jesus and live with Jesus in the community of his church. And everybody I know that's read the uh, stories from the street or heard the conversion stories of St. Paul people has a similar story. They, they you know, were going along, everything was fine. I, I think that's why they say a rich man has a harder time going to heaven. If everything is fine, you're, you're fine. But at some point you, you hit some kind of suffering you can't quite deal with. And that inspires you to look for answers and to ask uh, what, I, what I say the universal question of religion is, is why? Why are you doing this, God? Or why am I going through this? And you look for the answer to that why question. And uh, stories from the street helps people uh, learn from other people who've had those similar why experiences and how they've uh, transform their lives. So how do you go from a point of four of you on a blanket, mm -hmm. beside some jugglers, <laughs> yeah. to now having this St. Paul evangeliza street evangelization that's across the country now. Right. How, do you, how do you go from a blanket to being across the country? Yeah, the main thing for me was the thought, the realization that this is effective, mm. right? Figure that, Catholic street evangelization can be effective. And the other thing we did is, is I thought if we could just tell the story, like some of the stories mm. of the experiences that we were having, that we could encourage um, others to do something at least similar or the same thing. So we got on social media, Facebook, Twitter, we would post pictures of our outings and stories and tell the stories. And a lot of people would just latch onto that. They'd see that and they'd, they'd get back to us and they'd say, how do we do what you're doing? Um, we need some sort of training. Where do we get rosaries from? Where do we get pamphlets from? You know, how do we get a sign? You know, what do we say to people? Yeah. And, and so, you know, before long, I was spending a lot of time um, try, helping people around the country the United States and even beyond to start little street evangelization teams. And that just kind of organically grew from that. We realized, you know, somebody said, um, we want to give you some money, you know, and we said, well, we need a bank account, you know, <laughs> you know, cause ro you know, rosaries and pamphlets add up. They right. They cost expensive. money. Yeah. <laughs> and the, I went to the bank and they said, well, you need to like be a company, you know, so we had to incorporate. And, and so it was just a, a series of, doing one thing after another, after another, and um, it just kind of built itself. It was not my plan. In this book now, what you've done is you've gathered stories from other people mm. who have started their own St. Paul Street evangelization in their city, and they tell their stories of conversion. Right. Is there a particular story in here, you know, other than your own, that when you think back of all these people who contributed to this book, that you're like, oh, that's a great story yeah. that stands out? Yeah. Story after story are, are in there really good. I, I mean, just from uh, Uzi, he was mm. named after the machine gun, mm -hmm. and he was a leader of a gang, um, and he was shot seven times, and they thought he was gonna die, and in the hospital bed, 
somebody gave him a rosary and he started praying it. And that started his conversion process. And now uh, that led him to go out and start passing out sandwiches and rosaries and getting involved. A big conversion story. And another really good story in there is um, one of a prisoner, an evangelist who evangelizes in prison. Mm. He killed his father. Wow. And um, in a moment of rage, and he got life without parole. But he had a conversion in, in prison at, to the Catholic faith, and he wanted to give his life to evangelization. And so we sent him in prison all kinds of training resources and, and resources. So now he's in prison uh, doing St. Paul Street evangelization. <laughs> right from within the prison while yeah, he's there. Yeah. Wow. And there's a ton of other stories yeah. in there but they're all really, really good. So I'm sure people will be inspired, but what if they're thinking, you know, this is great for other people. Yeah. I'm not a street evangelist. So <laughs> I'd kind of like to throw three reasons at you that I think people might say, no, 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 this okay. isn't for me. And then you tell me um, why maybe they, they should still reconsider. So what if they said, I can't do this because I don't want to be attacked. Well, first of all, that's what I thought was going to happen to me, you yeah. know? But then I thought to myself, what happened to the apostles? It can't be that bad, right? So I Well, they I just had need, it pretty bad, but you yeah, say yeah, maybe yeah, not yeah. for us. Yeah, yeah. But I just need to get up the courage and go out and try it, you know? And and really, I was shocked and amazed at how little people yelled or screamed. I can only count on maybe one hand the times where it really got heated. I mean, once a lady yelled at us because the Catholic Church was the problem in the whole world, the poverty and because of overpopulation. Right. And she like, let us have it. She screamed at me for like 10 minutes, like straight. And I just let her, you know, she was obviously wounded and I prayed yeah. for her. Yeah. And, um, and, and sometimes, you know, people will walk by and say some, you know, smart aleck co comment or something like that. But that's about as, like I said earlier, the, you know, if people really, what I found is if people really hate our guts, like mm -hmm. the church's guts, they just keep walking. They usually, that's usually the case. All right. So, so nobody far attacks. Less, far less yeah. than you, you might imagine. Yeah, most people that we speak to are the people who are curious, you know, the people uh -huh. who are open. The people who are closed usually just keep walking. Yeah. So let's try another thing. What if someone says, all right, I'm not afraid of being attacked, but... I'm afraid I'm not smart enough. I haven't studied apologetics. I don't know how I would answer any questions people might have. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, when, when I first started doing street evangelization, I thought that it was going to be primarily just a bunch of apologetics. And, and I have to be honest, my apologetics have gotten a little bit rusty in the last six years because you don't do a lot of it out there on the street. What we found is, um, first of all, if you have a personal testimony, um, that's all you need to get started. You know, everybody's got a story. It might not be as dramatic as mine, mm -hmm. but, you know, most people who are interested in doing the work of evangelization have a love for Jesus and his church and have some story of, of um, how Jesus has changed their life, what he means in their life. So I would say if, as long as you can smile and be friendly, and tell your own story and ask people questions and be interested in their mm -hmm. life, then you can be an excellent, excellent evangelist. All right, so that brings me to my third thing. What if somebody says, you know what, that's just not my personality. I'm not very good at smiling and being welcoming yeah. to people. I'm, uh, is, it, is this a personality thing? Do you have to have a right, a right personality to be an evangelizer? For Catholics, evangelization is not uh, an option. You know, it's not optional. The Catechism states very clearly that evangelization is a duty. Paragraph 1816 even goes so far to say that evangelization is necessary for salvation. And so we need to get, get beyond that. Now, does that mean everybody is called to do street evangelization? No, no, but we all got to learn different ways to share the faith in our lives. We have all different sorts of personality types, though, who are involved in our evangelization apostolate. Um, our program director, Adam Janke, does a lot of our speaking. He's an introvert, you know, so talking to people is hard for him, yeah. but he just does it, you know. And, you know, it's just about having conversations. So it doesn't take a specific sort of personality type to have a conversation. A conversation might be harder for some people than others, but everybody can do it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same for street evangelization.
So let's say there's somebody out there who's thinking, you know what, I'm pretty inspired by this. I'm going to check out this book, and maybe this is something I want to look into, but I feel like I need some help. Where can they go if they want to start their own St. Paul Street Evangelization Group? Can, can they come to your website? Can they find resources? What can they do to get started? Yeah, so we have a website, streetevangelization.com. It's pretty easy. And not only do we have staff who can help them, walk with them, uh, help them discern whether or not to start a team. We also have online training. We've mm -hmm. founded a school of evangelization. So, um, yeah, so, you know, we teach you how to talk to people, how to start conversations. Um, what is the content of the gospel and why do we need to know it and how do you share it with people? Uh, what's the role of personal testimony? How do you pray with mm -hmm. people? Um, you know, those mm -hmm. sorts of things. And we really, we help people to know how to evangelize and to take a, a little bit of the mystery out of it. And we also have supplies like miraculous medals, the rosaries, things like that. Great. Um, have you gotten any reactions to the book? Anyone who's read it and been inspired by it? Have you heard back from anybody yet? Oh yeah, I mean, a lot of people uh, come coming back to us saying um, how it's really encouraged them to actually kind of step out in faith and evangelize, whether it be in their, their family circles or friends or coworkers or in a more direct way. Uh, the, our publisher, Ignatius Press, um, one of their staff read the book and uh, she said, her name is Eva. She, uh, she said, I got to start one of these teams. So she started our first team in San Francisco. Great, so, great. Yeah. So already right there, probably yeah. before it even yeah. hit the bookshelves, yeah. um, somebody was inspired. Yep. Absolutely. Well, this is wonderful. I'm sure a lot of people are going to find this very inspirational. And again, just telling stories, I think, is so effective. And that's what this book is all about. And that's what your street evangelizers are doing, are sharing stories and answering people's questions. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us today. It was a pleasure great. having you here. Thanks for having me. It was great. Well, we appreciate it here at Shalom. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. As always, happy reading. If you have good news, we expect you to want to share it. Salvation in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who for love of us and for our salvation came down from heaven. Salvation in His name, and He is the only Savior, is what we are on earth for. Therefore, all those who spread the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, we should encourage them. I can speak, but how many people can I reach alone? But the media, the television people, the radio, the newspapers, and all those who use the computer and its derivatives in various ways to spread the gospel. We must thank them. We must encourage them. We must work with them so that they can continue to spread the good news. There is so much news that is not so wonderful in the world, but there is also news that is wonderful on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We encourage them and beg God to bless them especially the Shalom World TV. God bless you. Shalom World, God's own channel.